The controversial No Child Left Behind Act of 2001 probably comes to mind for many of us when we think of a federal role in schools. In what ways can national or federal education policy address the needs of the most vulnerable, both normally and in this time of pandemic? Sure, well, th thanks for the question, Rick. It's a pleasure to join your class for this conversation. I guess it's I, where I'd start is just to frame the federal role in education. And to be clear, uh, the federal role is limited, but focused on civil rights and equity. And that has been the historic and historical role of the United States Education Department. If you wanna look for the origins of the federal role in education, you have to look to the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965, a civil rights law. In, in the course of our history, education has been thought of as a state and local function. But with the passage of ESEA in 1965, you had the emergence of a federal role focused on getting resources to the highest need students. And that was really the origin of the federal role. Lyndon Johnson himself, a former teacher, saw that education could be a pathway to opportunity and wanted there to be a federal investment in schools serving low-income students. From that evolved a broader federal role in enforcing civil rights law, um, and eventually the creation of the education department under President Carter. So the role of the federal education department only accounts for about eight to 10% of school funding, 90% of the funds come from the state and local level. And uh, the federal role is in many ways more focused on higher education because the federal government administers the Higher Education Act and is essentially a trillion dollar bank for student loans. In K-12, much of the responsibility falls to state and local government. And in this moment, what, what has been so heartbreaking over the last eight months is that even with that targeted federal role, the current federal government has failed to adequately address the consequences of COVID. It's important to say that before COVID, we had deep inequities. And many on this call are familiar with them. Low-income students and students of color were less likely to get quality early childhood education, less likely to have well-prepared teachers. Their schools are consistently funded at a lower level. Um, they are less likely to have access to advanced coursework like AP classes or international baccalaureate classes, less likely to have school counselors. We have 1.6 million kids in the United States who go to a school where there's a law enforcement officer and no school counselor. Now, when COVID hit, these inequities were exacerbated. Um, the health impact of COVID and the economic impact of COVID have fallen disproportionately on communities of color and low-income communities. And that has had a toll on students. But the educational inequities have been widened. We know that before COVID, about 79% of white families had reliable internet access, just 66% of black families, 61% of Latino families. And so some students haven't even been able to log on for their education since March. We had a significant device gap. We still have kids today who are doing their schoolwork on their mom's cell phone, which maybe they're sharing with a brother and a sister. The districts with the least resources had the hardest time providing professional development and support to their teachers to move school online. And they've really struggled to create safe environments back at school. And so it's often our largest and poorest districts that are still fully virtual or at best hybrid serving a relatively low percentage of students. We also know the socio-emotional toll of COVID has fallen hardest on those kids who are in homes where they've suffered health trauma, economic trauma, or where there was, all, there was already an issue of addiction or abuse or other challenges before COVID. So all of this means that we'll see significant learning loss. A number of, of items are, are in the chat highlight this. Uh, McKinsey did a study projecting about seven months of learning loss on average for all students, nine months for Latino students, 10 months for African-American students. It's a full school year. So the question now for the, for the federal government and state and local government is how will they respond? 
And this is a place where at Ed Trust, the organization I run, a civil rights organization, we are urging federal action. We think the federal government should be leading on these equity issues by getting resources to school districts, by making sure every kid has a device and every family has internet access, by providing additional resources to school districts so they can open safely, personal protective equipment, better ventilation, um, and a strategy for addressing learning loss. I'd love to see a national tutoring corps, which is something the United Kingdom is doing so that we mobilize recent college graduates to provide support for the students who've fallen behind. But so far, we haven't seen that federal leadership. We haven't seen it from the administration. And frankly, to date, we haven't seen adequate leadership in Congress, particularly in the Senate where they haven't been willing to move on a second stimulus package, which is desperately needed by school districts across the country. So that's the context into which we enter this conversation tonight. 